Welcome to Lecture 58, in which we're going to take our deepest look and most fundamental look at the nature of matter before, in the final two lectures, expanding outward to look at the entire universe. We're going to look here at particle physics today in this lecture. Particle physics we're going to look at very briefly because it's a topic that occupies could occupy a whole course of itself. In fact, there's a great course devoted entirely to particle physics. So we're going to look very quickly at particle physics and a history of particles and how particles join together and how we build up to the kind of matter we've already been talking about. If you think of our journey through a history of matter and our understanding of matter, we developed quantum physics, and then we used it to look at how atoms worked. Then we kind of expanded outward to look at molecules and solids. And then we contracted inward to look at the nucleus at the heart of the atom and how we could get energy out of that nucleus. We're continuing that journey with this lecture, delving deeper into the nucleus of the atom to talk about the elementary particles that make up the nucleus and the particles that make up the particles that make up the nucleus. Let me begin with a quick history of particle physics. Very brief history. Again, we're going to start with Democritus, who declared there were atoms, indivisible particles of matter. And Newton, seconding that in 1704, God in the beginning formed matter in solid, massy, hard, impenetrable, movable particles. Thompson, 1897, discovers the electron, the first hint that the atom is not, in fact, unbreakable, immutable. Einstein, in 1905, giving us a new kind of particles, photons, particles associated not with matter, but with, in this case, electromagnetic energy. Rutherford gives us the atomic nucleus and the picture of the atom as electrons surrounding this very small but very massive nucleus. In 1932, Chadwick discovered the neutron. Up until that time, it wasn't absolutely sure, absolutely certain what the nucleus was made of, although there were already plenty of hints that there were two kinds of particles in there, one of them positively charged, one of them neutral. That was clinched in 1932 with the discovery of the neutron. Anderson, in 1932, discovered the positron. The positron is the anti-electron, the antimatter part of the electron. This is the experimental confirmation of Dirac's 1928 idea I already talked about, where he took the positive and negative square roots of the Einstein mass-energy-momentum relationship and found that that uh, led to the idea that there had to be antimatter. Skip forward a little bit. In 1936, the same Anderson discovers a particle called the muon. And by the period 1940 to 1980, there were over 100 so-called elementary particles. I've put elementary in quotes here because most of them were not really elementary. And the final decades of the 20th century consisted of trying to make sense of these many, many elementary particles and try to work them into a simpler scheme, which was largely successful, although we still aren't completely there and we don't know whether our theory of elementary particles is really solid. Now, in 1964 to 1995, we began that simplification process with the idea of quarks, particles that made up what were originally thought to be elementary particles, like, for example, the proton and the neutron, no longer elementary but made of quarks. And by now, we have solid confirmation that quarks exist, and we understand quite well how they interact. What we have, in fact, is the standard model of particles and fields. We think it's a pretty good, thorough description of the elementary particles as they exist and how they interact. We know it isn't complete because there's things it doesn't tell us, like why the particles have the particular masses they do, and we have hints that there may have to be something that goes beyond the standard model. And a lot of the exciting work in high-energy physics today, both in very high-energy astrophysical observations, but more importantly in experiments done in large particle accelerators, are looking for physics beyond this standard model. But I'll be spending most of this lecture presenting the standard model as we understand it today. Tomorrow may bring something entirely different. So this is much more tentative physics here than we've done in some of the earlier lectures or in any of the earlier lectures. We understand that there are two kinds of elementary particles. There are the particles that make up matter, matter particles. They make up all ordinary matter. They are fermions. They are particles of half integer spin. They obey the exclusion principle. You can't put two of them close together in the same quantum state. And that's what gives rise to atoms and the periodic table and other things that we discussed in the lecture on atoms and how atoms follow from the Schrodinger equation. By the way, I'm talking about ordinary matter. As we'll see in the last couple of lectures, ordinary matter comprises only 4% of the stuff that the universe is made of, and we really don't know much about the rest. But we'll come to that. That's dark energy and dark matter, and we'll get there. But right now we're talking about the ordinary matter that makes up you and me and the earth and the sun and 
the stuff in our solar system and this, all that stuff, although there may be some of that non-ordinary matter here too, we just don't detect it. Then there are field particles, also called gauge bosons. And these are the particles that mediate the fundamental forces. These are the particles associated with things like electromagnetic fields. The photon, for example, is a gauge boson. They're bosons, and so they have integer spin. They don't obey the exclusion principle, which is why we can, for example, make a laser beam with a lot of photons all in exactly the same quantum state. So two basic kinds of particles, the particles that make up matter and the particles that are these gauge boson that mediate the fundamental forces in ways I'll describe. What are the elementary matter particles? The elementary matter particles come in basically two kinds. There are leptons. This means light particles. These are particles that do not experience the strong force that binds quarks together to make other particles and then residually binds those other particles together to make, for example, the atomic nucleus. So the force I talked about that binds the atomic nucleus together when in our electron nuclear physics, that force is really a residual of this very strong force that binds quarks, but the leptons don't feel the strong force. The leptons include the electron, a cousin of the electron that's more massive called the muon, and the tau particle, which is an even more massive cousin. And they also include three kinds of neutrinos, electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos. These are very light, almost but not quite zero mass. We used to think they had zero mass, but now we know they don't. Uh, very light neutral particles that have very, very weak interactions with matter and are very, very hard to detect. And by the way, every time I mention a particle, you should think automatically antiparticle. Because almost every one of these particles has an antiparticle. The electron has the positron, the muon has the anti-muon, the tau has the anti-tau, and there are anti-neutrinos. There are a few rare exceptions of particles that are their own antiparticles. One example is the photon. But mostly, when I talk about a particle, think immediately there's also an antiparticle in this zoo of particles. Then, in addition to leptons, there are quarks. These are more massive particles, and they come in pairs. There's an up-down pair, an up quark and a down quark, a strange and a charmed quark, a bottom and a top quark. These names are just fanciful names, as is the name quark, that physicists have given. They have nothing to do with the properties in ordinary language. An up quark has no upness about it. A strange quark, well, it is kind of strange. That's why it was named that, but there's... It's not strange in any way you would think of. A bottom and top quark, there's nothing bottom or top about them. These are just names. They experience the strong force. And they are the building blocks of particles called hadrons. Hadrons means heavy particles. Protons are hadrons. Neutrons are hadrons. There are plenty of other hadrons. By the way, you might wonder, why don't we see all these other particles I keep mentioning? It's because almost all the particles I'm going to mention are unstable. That is, left to their own devices, they quickly decay by... a basically radioactive decay. In fact, the radioactive decay we talked about in the nuclear physics lectures is often mediated by changes at the deeper level in these elementary particles. For example, beta decay is the changing of a neutron into a proton and an electron, something that's actually a change at the quark level. The building blocks of hadrons, and there are two kinds of hadrons, there are baryons, and baryons are made up of three quarks, and baryons are fermions, these half-integer spin particles that obey the exclusion principle. Baryons include the proton and neutron, common particles. Then there are mesons. Mesons consist of two quarks, a quark and an antiquark, in fact, and they are bosons because their spin angular momenta cancel so that they have integer spin, and so they are bosons, and they can pile up in the same quantum state, unlike the fermions. So again, remember the antiparticles. There are antileptons, and there are antiquarks to go with all of these. So those are the elementary matter particles. Now, let's take a closer look at this list. I've highlighted here the electron and the electron neutrino and the up-down quark. Together, those particles, the electron, its associated neutrino, and the pair of quarks, there's four particles and eight of them if you count their antiparticles, they constitute a family of elementary particles. And in fact, those particles that are highlighted here, the electron, the electron neutrino, and the up-down quark, particularly the electron and the up-down quark, comprise all ordinary matter. I should be a little careful when I say that because the other particles can come in and out of fleeting existence and they do actually play a minor role in ordinary matter. But basically, ordinary matter is made of electrons and up-down quarks. Everything, you, me, your car, your house, the oceans, Pluto, the sun, they're made of up-down quarks and electrons, basically. The other particles play very little roles in them. So that's the first family of elementary particles. Now I've highlighted some other particles. I've highlighted the muon, the muon neutrino, 
and the strange qu charmed quark pair. That's the second family of these basically elementary matter particles. And there's a third family, the tau and its associated neutrino, and the bottom and the top quarks. And what distinguishes these families as you move to the right in this sequence, you get to, into much, much heavier particles that are much less stable, much more short-lived, much more elusive in that sense. And you might think, well, hey, he's given us three families of particles. Surely physicists are about to discover a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. And the answer to that question or that statement is no, we aren't going to discover any more families. There is very good evidence that the number of part of the number of families is 2.99 plus or minus some small range of error in other words it's 3 we think for reasons we don't fully understand that the universe is giving us these three, three families of basic matter particles the elementary matter particles coming in their three families and here's a table of the particles that make up that first family there's the electron its symbol is e minus if i wrote e plus i would be talking about its antimatter particle a positron I'm giving its mass here in units high energy particles like to work in, which is million electron volts over C squared. You may remember we did a calculation one time back a few lectures about positron annihilation, and we found out that positron electron annihilation, and we found out you got a gamma rays of 511 kilo electron volts or 0.511 mega electron volts because that's the mass of an electron or positron in units of MeV over C squared, an energy unit over C squared. In other words, I'm writing the mass as an energy using Einstein's E equals MC squared, and the electron has charge minus E. There's the electron neutrino. Neutrinos are given the symbol nu, the Greek nu. This is nu sub E, the electron neutrino. Its mass is very small on the order of 10 to the minus 6 electron volts, or electron volts over C squared, and it has no charge because it's a neutrino. The up quark... The up quark uh, is symbol U. Its mass is on the order of 3 MeV over C squared. We don't know the quark masses very well, so I'm putting that little tilde. And its charge, interestingly, is two-thirds of E. What Robert Millikan measured in the early 1900s as the elementary charge E isn't really the elementary charge. The elementary charge is really the, ch the one-third of that. That's the charge on quarks, one-third or two-thirds of E. But the way quarks combine, we never get bare isolated particles with fractional charges. So the particles we actually observe directly have charge plus or minus E, or they could have multiples of E. But the quarks that make them up, the up quark, two-thirds E, the down quark, same thing, it's a little more massive, the D quark, and it has charge minus a third E. So those are the elementary matter particles of the first family. Here are the particles of the second family, the muon, a lot more massive, 106 MeV, it's about 200 times as massive as the electron. It's got the same charge as the electron, minus E. There's a muon neutrino, which we really don't know the neutrino masses very well, so that 10 to the minus 6 is pretty vague. And it turns out that electron and muon neutrinos can turn into each other. It's called the changing of flavor of the neutrinos. There's the strange quark and the charmed quark with the second family. Look at how much bigger their masses are, 100 and 1,300. Their charges are comparable, minus a third E and two-thirds E. And finally, there's that third family with the tau at 1777 MeV over C squared, big mass. But otherwise, it's like an electron. It has negative charge. It responds to the same forces that the electron does, not to the strong force. There's a tau neutrino. There's a bottom quark and a top quark, and those things are really massive. So those are the particles that make up all matter, and the ones in the table at the left basically make up all ordinary matter, and the other ones are so short-lived, their existence in the universe is basically very fleeting. Let's talk a little bit about how we make more composite particles out of these elementary particles. So here's some examples of composite particles. At the top, I've got the proton. Its symbol is P. Its mass is about 938 MeV over C squared. Its charge is plus E exactly the opposite of the electron's charge. What is its lifetime? We're pretty sure, but not 100% sure, that the proton is stable. In other words, it lasts forever. There is some question about that, and there have been experiments to test simple theories that suggested the proton might have a lifetime on the order of 10 to the 31 years or so, and those experiments have ruled out it being unstable on that short, 10 to the 31, wow, that's long, a time scale. But we're not 100% sure, we think it's stable. And its composition is two up quarks and a down quark. And if you look on the previous tables at the charges of the up quark and the down quark and add them up, lo and behold, those fractional charges add up to plus E. Neutron, very close cousin of the proton. It's neutral. Its symbol is N. Its mass is almost exactly the same. Its charge is zero. Its lifetime, interestingly, you think of the neutron as a common particle. Outside the nucleus, it's unstable with a lifetime on the order of 20 minutes 
not quite a thousand seconds, and its quark composition is uh, UDD, and if you add up the charges of U, D, and D, you get zero, and so it has no net charge. Just one other example of one of the many composite particles is the pion, the positive pion, symbol pi plus. Um, you can see its mass there is not as big as that of the proton or neutron. Its um, charge is plus E. Its lifetime is quite short. It's a like all these particles, except for the proton and to some extent the neutron, is very unstable. It has a very short lifetime. And its quark composition is U D bar. That is U up quark and a uh, anti-down quark. And that gives it its charge of plus one. And you can work that out if you look at those tables and think about antiparticles. So there are some examples of composite particles. The first two, again, are baryons. They're made of three quarks. And they're fermions. They obey the exclusion principle. The last one, the meson, it's a meson. A meson is made of two quarks, actually a quark and anti-quark. And there it is. There are some quantities that we know are conserved with elementary particles. Some of them we've seen before. Electric charge is conserved. Spin angular momentum is conserved because angular momentum is conserved. Baryon number we think is conserved. Baryon number is one if you're a baryon and zero if you're not. And minus one if you're an anti-baryon. Plus one for baryons, anti-baryons, zero for non-baryons. So an electron has no baryon, has zero baryon number. Lepton number. If you're a lepton, an electron, a tau, whatever, you got lepton number plus or minus one, depending on whether you're a lepton or an anti-lepton, otherwise it's zero. Again, these question marks suggest we don't know for absolutely sure that these things are conserved. Strangest we know is conserved in strong and electromagnetic interactions. It can change in interactions involving a force called the weak force, the one that was responsible for nuclear beta decay, as we discussed. And there's a color charge. Quarks, it turns out, whoa, are complicated. Not only are there six kinds of quarks and they're anti-quarks, there are three kinds of charge, rather than plus and minus for electric charge, and that color charge, it's called, seems to be conserved. So we can begin to write particle reactions. For example, here is the decay of a neutron. A neutron decays into a proton and an electron with that half-life of about 1,000 seconds, and also an anti-neutrino. And this is the reaction that's at the heart of beta decay of a radioactive nucleus, like, for example, radioactive iodine that got spewed out in the Fukushima nuclear accident. It's decaying by beta decay, and it's decaying ultimately through a neutron turning into a proton and an electron. And if we add up the charge here, the neutron is neutral, the proton is plus one, the electron has minus one, so charge, and the neutron is neutral, so the charge is conserved. We add up baryon number, we get one on the left, one on the right, that's good. We add up lepton number, we got no leptons on the left, we got one lepton on the right, the electron, we got one anti-lepton, the anti-neutrino, plus one, minus one, zero. That's good. Strangeness, nothing here is strange. Uh, let's look at some other particle reactions. Here's a fascinating one. Here's a proton-proton collision, a common reaction that's studied in big particle accelerators. P plus P gives us P plus P plus another particle, in this case a neutral pi meson. How can that be? Well, it's E equals mc squared at work. In come two protons with high energies. They collide. Out of their kinetic energy can form another particle. And that's what's happening in this reaction. And this one's OK, because on the left, we've got two positive charges. On the right, we've got two positive charges. The pion is neutral. The baryon number, the pion is not a baryon. It's a meson, so baryon number is conserved. There's no leptons here, no strangeness. That's a good reaction. Obeys those, those rules. Uh, here is another one. P plus P goes to P plus neutron plus pi plus. That works, too. Two charges, two positive charges on the left, two on the right. The neutral, neutron is neutral. The baryons, we got two on the left, two on the right. We're good with that. We're good with everything else. Here's a really wild one. Two protons collide. Out come three protons and an antiproton. Notice something here. Numbers of particles are not conserved. They don't have to be. And that's a consequence of collisions that are happening at very high energies where E equals mc squared comes into play and the energies are high enough to create new particles. In this case, the new particle is a proton-antiproton pair, and this reaction could only happen if the incident protons carried so much energy that their kinetic energies were enough to make a whole other proton-antiproton pair. That one works because the charges all add up because the antiproton has minus one. The baryon numbers work because the antiproton has minus one, and everything's good there. Here's another one. Proton-proton goes to proton plus proton plus pi plus plus antiproton. Hmm, 
<clears throat> Let's look at this one. Charge is conserved. Two on the left, two on the right, with the minus one canceling. Baryon number two on the left. Uh oh. Two on the right, but then there's the minus one. That reaction is no good. That one can't occur because it doesn't satisfy baryon number conservation. And finally, here's what really goes on in our big particle accelerators. This is a photograph from one of the first collisions at the uh, Large Hadron Collider in, in Switzerland, on the Swiss-French border, one of our, large, our largest particle accelerator. Two protons come together, they collide, and they make a huge spew of many particles out of the enormous 7 tera electron volt proton-proton collision energy that they have. And that's a picture. And I couldn't write this reaction out, but all kinds of particles are coming out. And this collision tells us a lot about those particles and the interactions of particles. Speaking of interactions, let's move on and look at how quantum physics deals with the interactions of particles through forces. Forces between matter particles, like the electric force or the strong force, result from the exchange of these other particles called gauge bosons. In the electromagnetic case, that's the photon. It has mass zero, and that incidentally is what gives the electric force its relatively long range. It's one over r squared fall off. In the case of the strong force, the particle is called a gluon. Ugh, there are eight kinds. They have zero mass. In the case of the weak force, there are some bosons called the W and Z bosons, and they have uh, mass, and consequently they're force is much weaker. And if we could bring gravity into the fold here, it would be described by a particle called the graviton, also a massless gauge boson. And here's on the right a Feynman diagram, uh, originated by Richard Feynman, that shows time advancing in the vertical direction. Two particles are coming near each other, and they engage what's called, a, they exchange what's called a virtual photon, a photon that comes into existence for just a fleeting time. It doesn't violate conservation of energy because energy time uncertainty allows it to exist given the uncertainty. So the uncertainty principle is allowing this. That's how forces work in quantum electrodynamics and quantum field theory, the quantized versions of our everyday theories. And they tell us that forces ultimately involve the exchange of a particle. Look at two forces in particular. The electromagnetic force is described by the photon, which carries no electric charge. Photons are uncharged. That's why the superposition principle that I emphasize so much holds in electromagnetism, and it's what makes the mathematics of electromagnetism relatively easy to deal with. The strong force, on the other hand, is mediated by eight gauge bosons, eight different kinds of gluons, and there are six color-anti-color combinations of these gluons, and there are two that are colorless. I'm talking about that color charge I mentioned earlier. And, whoa, the gluons themselves carry color charge. And it's the fact that the gluons carry color charge that makes the superposition principle not hold and makes the math of particle interactions involving the strong force a lot harder. It would be worse in electricity if photons had charge or equivalently in classical terms if the electric field was charged, but it isn't. But in the strong case it is, and that makes it very difficult. One other thing about the strong force is the strong force binds the quarks together. And you might think, well, can't we just break the strong force and and pull isolated quarks apart. We think we can't. We think you'll never find an isolated quark. And the reason is, as you stretch the quarks, the strong force, instead of falling off, actually stays about the same strength. And you're building up more and more and more energy in what I've sort of represented here as the field lines of the strong force. And eventually, you build up so much energy that it's energetic for this system to break into a quark-anti-quark -quark pair. And instead of creating separate quarks, you've created out of the energy you put into stretching that strong force quark interaction, you've put it into making more quarks instead. So we believe that we can't get isolated quarks. The closest we've come is something called a quark gluon plasma that we think we've created in one of our particle accelerators. Speaking of particle accelerators, how do we know all this? Well, we know most of this from an interaction of theory and experiments, and the experiments are basically done with particle accelerators, devices that accelerate these elementary particles to enormously high energies and then slam them into each other, and out they come. Some physicists have likened that to trying to figure out how expensive watches work by throwing them at each other and watching what comes out. Well, that's sort of the state of the art we're at. Um, some of the early contributions were made by a particle accelerator called SLAC at Stanford University, the Standard Lin Stanford Linear Accelerator, now the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. It's mostly used now in materials science and biology, but it made a lot of important discoveries in the 1970s. The 
many other particle accelerators, the Fermilab Particle Accelerator at Illinois, which is just about to be shut down. But the big one is the Large Hadron Collider at Geneva, Switzerland, or at, on the Swiss-French border. And let me just give you some examples. The uh, SLAC Collider, the SLAC uh, is now a collider. It was just an accelerator. The Stanford Linear Accelerator is a three-kilometer long, two-mile long device that accelerates particles to about 90 GeV, 90 billion electron volts. If you've driven Interstate 280 from San Francisco down toward Palo Alto and San Jose, at Palo Alto, you will cross over SLAC. You'll look in both directions, and you see this long concrete tunnel. That's the Stanford Linear Accelerator. It's the biggest linear accelerator ever been built. Then we have synchrotrons. These are circular devices. This is the location of the Large Hadron Collider. It's 27 kilometers around. It accelerates proton beams to 7 TeV. They collide with an energy of 14 TeV. We're not quite there yet, but when it's completed, when we're up to full energy, it will be doing that. And it uses large superconducting magnets to hold these charged particles with the magnetic force in these circular paths. Why do these particle accelerators have to be so big? Well, here's the reason. We either have to make them straight line objects and accelerate the particles in there, or we, to save space, basically, we have to make them in these big circular paths. But as soon as a particle is going in a circle, it's being accelerated. And if it's going at very high speeds, and the speeds in here are 0.9999999 many nines of the speed of light, then these particles radiate like mad, and it becomes harder and harder and harder to put more energy into them. And the way to avoid that is to make the circle less, the circle more gentle. That is, make it bigger so the things don't turn very tight corners. And that's the reason these particle accelerators, the basic reason why they are so enormous, to keep that uh, acceleration down and keep the energy losses down. Now, we are hoping to build even bigger particle accelerators, but the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, is just beginning its career. What might we discover as we go to higher energies? One thing we're hoping to discover is a particle called the Higgs boson, which the standard model says should exist and should be responsible for giving the other particles their mass. And if we discover it, which might happen any day, we will understand a little bit more about how the particles get their masses. At even higher energies, we think there are energies where what now look like separate forces will be unified into one. We already know that the weak force and the electromagnetic force are related, and we know how to join them. But at even higher energies, the strong force and the electric force will be joined. Will we ever join gravity with the rest of them? That's a little harder. We may find what are called supersymmetric partners, more massive particles that coincide with the known particles. We may find extra dimensions of space and time. And in fact, we may find out something about the earliest universe because our biggest accelerators are really time machines. Because in these massive collisions, we are simulating the very high temperatures, the high energies of particles in the very early instance of the universe. So these are time machines taking us back to a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, and we are probing the smallest distance scales available in the universe, and we're probing conditions that exist in the very earliest universe. So you can really think of these giant accelerators as time machines and as the particles they're creating as our clues to what was going on at those very earliest times. It's a fascinating field, and that's what's driving the call for ever bigger particle accelerators. Okay, let's wrap up this discussion, brief discussion of particle physics. We know there are two kinds of particles. There are the matter particles, and they, they include the quarks and the leptons. There are the gauge bosons, the particles that mediate the interactions, the forces between matter particles. They include photons, gluons, these bosons, and maybe gravitons. There are three families of matter particles. Only one of them seems to play a major role in everyday matter. There are composite particles. Baryons made of three quarks include the familiar proton and neutron. Mesons made of a quark and an antiquark, less familiar. They're all unstable, so they don't hang around long. Particle interactions obey conservation laws, some of which seem to be absolute and some of which are either not absolute or we're not sure. Uh, there is the strong force which confines the quarks to make the protons and neutrons and many other particles, and that seems to confine quarks in a way that you can never break individual quarks free. And finally, we looked at particle accelerators, the machines, sometimes time machines, that give us the insights into how all these particles work and what the early universe was like. <laughs>